I used to be a surgeon <laughs> and operated on patients with cancer for many years. And I have to say today I'm now um, running a biotech looking at the immunotherapy of cancer, the treatment of cancer using the immune system. And I want to share some ideas and thoughts with you and my experiences today. One of the great things I learned is that in cancer treatment we we rely very, very heavily on nature to heal the patient. It's the same in any form of surgery. Without nature to heal the wounds that we inflict, we'll get nowhere. And as I said, we have the doubtful honor that most of our patients get better despite us rather than because of us. Without the power of nature to heal and the motivation of the patient to get better, then you don't get very good results. We rely on patients to be motivated, to have a positive attitude, but we also try to deal with those patients who are depressed and give up and die for no particularly good reason. Now, this is the London School of Economics, and I have to give you some statistics. And this slide shows you that one in two people are going to get cancer if you haven't already got it. Half of you have got cancer or will get it, and that's really quite bad news. The problem is a third to a quarter of you will die of it as it stands today. The good news is that cancer survival in the UK has improved in the last 40 years for many cancers and generally 50% will survive more than 10 years. But if you look at this slide, which is the experience of the development of improvement of cancer treatment in the last 40 years since I was a medical student, you'll see that there are lots of lines that are reaching the right-hand side of the slide, approaching survivals of 100%. Testicular tumor, Hodgkin's disease, breast cancer is getting better, melanoma's got better. But there are still some where the lines are very short, and the worst of the lot is pancreatic cancer. The average survival of a pancreatic cancer patient is under six months. It's appalling. There is lung, stomach, brain. There are a lot of baddies out there, but pancreas is still the worst. We have a long way to go. And one of the things we learned is this effect of motivation and of the effect of stress uh, on survival. Now, I want to tell you the story of the girl who gave me this little figurine. She, we'll call her Mary. Many years ago, she was a 35-year-old woman who had a child. She was a single mother and a teacher. And she developed a very nasty cancer called a sarcoma in her abdomen. No chemotherapy, no radiotherapy is going to work. Surgery was pretty hopeless once it had spread, which it had. She went to see the surgeon who gave her the bad news and asked him to do something. She had to stay alive. She said, I must have at least five years of survival. My boy is 12, 13 years old. If I can live five years, he is a brilliant musical scholar, he can get a scholarship to one of the major universities and then at least his future will be guaranteed and I can die in peace. But I must have five years. And the rather nice surgeon said, nah, you're going to die. It got, you've been, you know, no chance. Sorry, go away and die in peace. Don't bother me. So she didn't like that. And she said, do you know what? I'm going to come back here in five years' time with a bucket of water and I'm going to pour it on your head. And he said, well, pff, you're going to be gone in five months. It's not, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay dry. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so she turned up on my doorstep and my team. And do you know what? We were so amazed by the power of this woman's attitude that we operated on her. And we kept operating on her because there was nothing else that would work. And what was amazing was she survived the operation. I know my reputation as a surgeon wasn't brilliant, but she did survive. <laughs> And actually, there were times when the tumor went berserk. And at one point, the, the, she had 12 kilos of tumor in her liver that we were able to remove. She looked like she had triplets. And she did very well. But it was her willingness to survive these tremendous assaults on her body. 
And do you know what? Five years later, she walked into the surgery of this gentleman, and she had a bucket of water, and she put it on his desk and said, yep, remember me? And he said, oh, you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. And actually, you're such an unpleasant man, I'm not even going to bother you with the water. I'm going to give it to this plant over here, which is much more deserving. And she poured it on the plant. Now, what's interesting is that the five years were up. And she phoned me, and she sent me this figurine, said, Charles, this is something for you to remember me by. I'll be going now. The good news is that my son has got the top scholarship to the top university, and he's all set. I've done what I set out to do, and I'll be off. I said, well, where are you going? Because the disease didn't seem too bad. She didn't have that much bulk of disease. Five days later, she was dead. She'd had enough. Now, what is that? What, what was it that kept her alive? You know, what is it that, that, and this fascinated me. So, when I came to retire, one of my patients who I'd operated on 20 years earlier, and had done very well, despite me, rather than because of me, and had made a lot of money, wanted to put something back into research. And he gave, he said, gave me 10 million pounds to donate to cancer research. Do you know what? I try to give 10 million pounds away. I think any of you would probably find a good excuse. But the academic institutions who were working on cancer said, well, what do you want us to spend this money on? And I said, on the immunology of cancer. And they said, well, what's immunology got to do with cancer? And we'll come back to that in a moment. So I thought, well, that's bonkers. Immunology's got everything to do with cancer. To me, immunology is the basis on which just about every healing process occurs. Now those of you youngsters in the audience who watch the X-Men will know of a character called Wolverine. Wolverine has healing factor. And that's what we want. We want healing factor. Trouble is, it's not that easy to distill. But that girl Mary had something like that. And it was driven through her immune system. There was some story there that mattered. So I thought we should look at this and try and bottle it if we can, to try and make this extraordinary attitude that she had. Now what was that attitude? It was hope. And again, just because this is the LSE and you're all classical scholars, you all know that hope came as the last resort from Pandora's box. Pandora was the first woman. She was given a box. Actually it was a jar, but before anybody writes in, we, everybody knows it is a box. And the gods had put all the ills of the world in this box. Now, being Pandora, and probably a, a primordial investigative journalist, she opened the box. <laughs> and all the ills of the world came out, and she despaired. But there was a little voice at the bottom of the jar that said, don't despair, have hope. And that's the spirit of hope. And that's why this particular logo that we have, I set up a research group using this logo, as hope. She represents the spirit of hope. And I want to bottle this hope. Now let's come back to immunology. What is immunology? It is that healing factor that deals with protection against infection, it deals with wound healing, it deals with reconstruction, it deals with repair, it monitors your entire system. So why is it that cancer is a problem? Because surely the immune system is there to police cancer. The answer is cancer is very clever. Those of you who are young will see what the problem is in that slide straight away. Those of you who are a bit older will take a few seconds, and those who are old like me won't see it at all. <laughs> but can you see what the problem is? If you look carefully, you will see that there's a snake. And I think that's the most fantastic camouflage. And that's what cancer does. It hides in full view. And that's what it does to you if you don't see it. That's one of the most venomous snakes in the world, and it will kill you in the same way that cancer will kill you if you don't recognize it. And what we need to do is to find a way of making the leaves get out of the way or making the snake wriggle so that we can spot it. Now that's to do with the immune system. Those of you who are young, have a good immune system, will spot it straight away. Those who, as you get older, the immune system corrupts, a bit like a computer, and those who are very old will not see it. So what we try to do is to tune the immune system and amplify so that we tune 
the, the system to spot the snake. Not easy, because the snake uses the same targets as f f occur in your own body, and to amplify. And the reason that we haven't been able to defeat cancer is we've concentrated on the amplification and what we call learnt or adaptive immunity. This is where you all know about it because you've been vaccinated for tetanus and diphtheria. Little bit of what's bad does you good, and you learn how to deal with it. We've tried to vaccinate against cancer. It's hopeless. And the reason is this. Here's an old-fashioned radio. It's my generation of radio. You wanted to tune in to um, Radio Caroline. Um, you, you had a volume control, and you have a, uh, a, a tuner. The tuning is immunomodulation to tune in. The volume control is immunoadjuvants. If you turn the tuning control to the right station, that's a good start. Without the volume, you get nowhere. You have to have volume, and that's where we've gone wrong before. Now, the corollary is, is, is true. If you have big volume and you don't have tuning, again, you just make noise and you blow your ears out. So the secret is to combine the two, to get tuning, and turn the volume up. Now, interestingly, the greatest advance in recent years in immunotherapy, which is now all over the news, all of you now know that immunotherapy is actually quite important, unlike my friends that I tried to give the 10 million to 10 years ago who decided there was no point. These are called the checkpoint inhibitors. The checkpoint inhibitors turn the volume up. They boost the immune system, but they don't tune. Now, interestingly, those of you who are heavy metal fans will know that you can turn not to 10, but to 11. And that's what the checkpoints do. They turn the amplitude right up to 11. They blow your ears out. If you're lucky, one of the 15% that respond, the tuning happens to be about right. You can hear some music, and you get miraculous responses. I mean, really fantastic responses with long-term, possibly even, yes, we hesitate to use the word cure. Very unusual in cancer. But what I'm working on is trying to improve that signal into a, a modulated signal so that you tune into the right station, combine the different things, and you'll get somewhere. There are no magic bullets. That combination is critical. But what's really important to the combination is that you have to make sure you use every modality at your disposal. If you're stressed, as I've intimated, you're going to do badly. In fact, you'll, your cancer will get worse and it'll recur. If you are well motivated, generally you'll do well. This is probably something to do with the placebo effect. You've all heard of this. When you do a trial, you give half the patient sugar tablets and you give half the patient the active ingredient. What is extraordinary is that some 15% of those patients who get sugar will actually respond. Why? Can't we bottle that? Can't we bottle the Marys of this world and try and get something work to, to work? And I think that's where hope and the brain and the immune system has come in. And we have data now that shows that boosting the immune system improves the situation in the brain, improves coping behavior, improves depression. And do you know what? If you've got cancer, I think it improves that too. So what we're trying to do is this. I think what is the concentrate of what I'm talking about is really crystallized by hope. It is, dis it is the treatment of despair. And if we can turn hope into a reality, something that we can actually use through a scientific method, then we're on the brink of creating something quite wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs>